Now, last week we started this series on walking by faith. The Bible says we walk by faith, not by sight. What does that mean? What's the adventure of faith walking? Remember I invited Kay and Andy and Stacy, our new pastors coming, to join me in that message. We did the first five points. I filled in the blank if you missed last week, but you really need to go online and watch that message. It's filled with a lot of wisdom uh, from all these people who shared the message with me. Now we're gonna start at point five, which if you write, write this down, faith is giving when I don't have it. Giving when I don't have it. Let's start right now. Walking by faith also means giving when I don't have it. It's easy to give when you got it, but giving when I don't have it is giving and faith. Giving and faith go together so much. Did you know that the Bible stocks, there are more promises about giving in the Bible than any other subject? Why? Because God wants us to be like himself. God is a giver. God so loved the world that he gave. You can give without loving. You cannot love without giving. Giving and faith go together, and God uses finances. I'm absolutely convinced God uses finances to test your faith more than any other subject. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had to decide between tithing and paying a bill? This is a test. Mm -hmm. In God's hall of fame that we have in Hebrews 11, it's Moses, it's Abraham, it's David, it's Jonah. In God's hall of fame, the first guy who gets mentioned, you know who it is? Abel. What did Abel do that was such a big act of faith? He gave an offering. And he made it in the God's hall of fame for giving an offering. He gave an offering in faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse four. It was faith that made Abel's offering to God a better sacrifice than Cain's. Through his faith, God approved of his giving. Now I want you to notice in that verse, if you're looking at it, it's not what he gave that pleased God, it's how he gave it. It's not the amount he gave, it's the attitude that he gave it with. Most people think that God looks at how much you give. He doesn't. God doesn't look at how much you give. You know what he looks at? How much is left over. How much did you give compared to how much he's already given to you? Now, you've heard me talk about this before. There are two ways to give. You can give in faith or you can give in fear. You can give what's called by reason or you can give by revelation. When you give by reason, Anybody can do that. I can give based on reason. I know what is it? I look at what I've got. I take my checkbook or my bank account and I see how much I've got and I figure out a reasonable amount to give to God. And I give what I think I can afford. That doesn't require any faith at all, giving by reason. An atheist can give by reason. Philanthropists do it all the time. They look at their checkbook, I can give this much, a reasonable amount, and they give by reason. Or, if you want to be, live in adventure of faith, as Kay and I have for years, you can give based on revelation. And what does that mean? I pray and I ask God, God, what do you want to give through me? How much do you want me to trust you for this time? A good example of this is the Macedonians in 2 Chronicles, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It says this. Because of their great joy, they gave even more than they could afford. How do you do that? How do you give more than you can afford? By giving in faith, by giving as a revelation, not by reason. Let's talk about that a little bit. Who wants to start on that one? When we first got married, um, we were in seminary. We were making less money than it cost for us to be there. And we were pretty committed to not take on debt to get through seminary. And at the same time, we made a commitment when we got married, we're, we're going to tithe. That's never a question. First tenth of what we get goes back to God. And there was this season where I was watching the amount of money that we had in the checking account go down, 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 down. It was the end of the semester. Yeah. And there was this one day. And these are, sometimes these are the stories that are most precious in the formation of our faith. Yeah. The, there was this one day. And I could see that we were about to hit the bottom of the checking account and we needed like $250 for a yeah. bill. And Stacy went out to the mailbox and she got this envelope and it was from a gal by the name of Ashley Jett. She was Stacy's college roommate. 
And she said, God put it on my heart to give this amount of money to you guys. And it was the exact amount of money that we, <laughs> we had that happen. The exact same thing happened to us. Yeah. Yeah. And th- those stories are, are so formational in our character. Yeah. And I think they became, for us personally, the bedrock for ministry. Yeah. Of like we, we can never ask other people to do things that we're not willing yeah. to do ourselves. Yeah. And it, it does shock me when I find people who are followers of Jesus and they're not committed to put God first in yeah. their generosity. Um, but there are so many moments where God exceeds expectation and does things miraculously. We had multiple giving initiatives like Saddleback has had here. And in those giving initiatives, several of them were for buildings, first building, second building. And we always felt like God was saying, I want you to sacrifice first. There were several times where we as a family, we had saved up a sum of money to buy a house. And we knew in the Bay Area, it was gonna be crazy to own a home very similar to Southern California. And we still sense God saying, I want, you to, I want you to go first. I want you to dump your savings into this vision. Yeah. And two times we did that. We didn't know how God was going to provide for us to buy a home in the Bay Area, which we lived in for seven years. But there was this, this person that said, I'm going to buy a house. I'm going to let you live in it for free for a period. And then at the end of it, I'm going to sell it to you. And when I sell it to you, I'm going to sell it to you for the exact same price that I bought it for. Wow. So we were able to live in the home for free and save up yeah. and totally exceeded the amount of money that we had given away. Fantastic. And, and God is able. I know you guys have so many of those stories yeah. from your journey. Yeah. yeah. Lots of them. I think we, one principle that we live by is just that you can't outgive God. And even if it seems ridiculous to like empty out your savings account and how, are, how in the world are you ever gonna get into a home? We just live by that principle, you can't outgive God. And you don't know where the provision's gonna come from. You never can see it in advance. You don't know, oh, well, someone's gonna offer to cover the expense of your home while you save up a down payment. Like God never tells you that in advance. But just that principle of, I can't outgive God. He is more generous. He has more capacity to bless than I can imagine. And I can trust him. He's a good father and he's gonna provide for us. And so just living with open hands and if if he asks for it, it's his anyway, the answer is yes. And I think there's a lot of joy in that. Yeah. Mm. Katie, you wanna say anything? You tell these stories way better than I do. (laughs) Well, I'm not going to tell you all the stories. You've heard them all before. I'll just say this. You don't really know what joy is till you understand the joy of sacrificial giving and faith. When you step out, way out on the, on the limb and go, there's no way we can afford to give this. And it's scaring you to death. If you haven't ever been afraid and yet said, this is the right thing to do, you've never experienced the joy of God bailing you out. When Kay and I got married, we decided God gets first. First 10%, we raise it every year, you know that. We're now reverse tithers. We give away 91% and, and live on nine. I've served this church for free for 43 years. Why? Because you can't outgive God. And, and, and I, we, we tested God in little ways of giving 10 bucks and 50 bucks and 100 bucks when we had nothing, nothing, and when the cupboard was bare. And then it's stair steps, and it's like a muscle. You get stronger and stronger till. You, you, keep, you can give away more than you ever possibly imagined. I, 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 can't even, I, I couldn't even tell you because I, w- I wouldn't want to brag, but I just can't imagine what God can do if you'll just trust him in this area. Money is an acid test of your faith. The Bible says, if you are unfaithful with unrighteous mammon, who will trust you the true riches of God? People have often asked me, why do you think God chose you to write the best-selling book in American history? Because God knew what I'd do with the money. Mm-hmm. He knew that we wouldn't, we wouldn't spend it on ourselves. We already had a 30-year track record of, of sacrificial giving. Now, there's some people say, God, you give to me first, and then I'll give you. God, God says, no, you prime the pump. Mm-hmm. Giving by faith is when you put God first. Honor the Lord by giving the first part of all your income and he will fill your barns and barrels to flow. I don't, honestly, as Andy said, I don't understand how people can trust God for their eternal salvation, but they don't trust God to pay their bills if they put him first in their finances. 
If you can't trust him with your money, how in the world can you trust him with your eternal salvation? See, that's what God is saying. Can I say one more thing about this? Sure, go right ahead. In our journey at Echo, one of the things that we saw is when we would go first, the church would follow. And then what we experienced when the church would follow, there was always a season of God's favor in Mm. those sacrificial moments. Yeah. And I believe that to be so core. When there, whenever there is a movement of the good news of Jesus that is spreading, mm-hmm. there's a group of people at the core of that that are trusting God with sacrificial generosity. Amen. Well, you're right. We've done, I think, eight major giving campaigns uh, three years at a time in, in the history of Saddleback. And I've always loved them more than any other time for, because three reasons. I know people are gonna grow. I know their, their faith is gonna be stretched. I know there's gonna be incredible joy. It's gonna get to be a happy place because it's more blessed to give, more joyful to give than to receive. And I know there's gonna be tests. There's gonna be tests. And so uh, it's just one of the seven ways we walk by faith. And if you haven't learned to walk by faith in that area, guess what? You're cheating yourself. All right, let's go to the next one. Walking by faith is believing when I don't see it, obeying when I don't understand it, persisting when I don't feel like it, announcing in advance before I have it, and number six, walking by faith is thanking God before I receive it. Thanking God before I receive it. You know, a good illustration of this sixth point is uh, the victory over Jericho. Look at this verse, Hebrews 11.30. By faith, The people walked, there's the walking again. By faith, the people walked around the walls of Jericho for seven days and the walls came crashing down. Now what's going on here? They're coming out of Egypt, they're coming into the promised land. God says it's your land, but you're gonna have to fight for the land. Jericho was the most fortified city in the entire world at this time. Highest, deepest, thickest walls. And um, the battle for the city of Jericho is gonna be really rough. There's no way they're gonna tear those walls down. But God tells his people, I want you to spend seven days walking around the outside of the walls of Jericho. And what were they told to do? Thank me in advance. Praise me in advance. Thank me in advance. Thank you, God, the walls have already fallen down. And on the seventh day, what happens? The walls fall down. They didn't even have to fight the battle. Jericho is given theirs. They take it down. Now, faith is not believing God can do something. Faith is not believing, hoping God will do something. Faith is believing God is working and expressing thanks in advance. Look at this verse, Mark eleven twenty four. 24. This is Jesus. When you pray and ask for something, believe that you have received it. Notice, past tense, circle that. Believe that you have received it and you will be given what you ask for. Wait a minute, you mean I gotta believe a thing is so, even though it isn't so, in order that it might become so? Yep, that's called faith. When you thank God for an answer to your prayer after it's been answered, that's called gratitude. When you thank God for an answer to prayer before it's answered, that's called faith. Faith is thanking God in advance. Let me give you an illustration. If I were to give you a check for $1,000, would you wait until you cashed it to thank me? If I handed you a check for $1,000, here it is. Thank you, Rick. Thank you for that check. You haven't cashed it yet, but you're thanking me in advance because you believe my check is credible. Jesus says, because of your faith, it will happen to you. Faith is thanking God in advance. Anybody want to say anything about that? Yeah, one of the practices that helps me is going on a prayer walk. Yeah. A little short, 15 minutes, 10 minutes. And most of the situations I find myself in, not all, but most of the situations I find myself in, I've been in similar situations in the past. There's mm. pattern, there are patterns. 
And within the pattern, I can look back and I can see the hand of God. So what I like to do is take my past, my present, and my future and tie them together mm -hmm. on a gratitude prayer walk. Mm -hmm. And I'll remember the faithfulness of God in conjunction with my current situation and tie it to what I believe God's going to do in the future and thank him for that. Yeah. And I find that that little, that little act of that prayer walking, those situations coming together, it just lifts my eyes to the power of God. He's been yeah. faithful in the past and he's going to be faithful in the future. Mm. You guys get that past, present, future that you pray? This is the way Jehoshaphat prayed in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Jehoshaphat is facing three enemies, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. They're going to be killed. They're three to one. And by the way, you have three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. They're coming against him. Jehoshaphat prays a simple prayer that has three questions in it. Lord, are you not? Lord, did you not? And Lord, will you not? That's exactly what Andy just talked about. Lord, are you not the God who's in control of the whole world? Lord, did you not help us in the past? And number three, Lord, will you not help us now? Mm -hmm. That is what it means to pray in faith. Mm -hmm. Look at, as Andy just said, past, present, future. Lord, I know who you are. I know what you've done in the past. I, and, and I know who you are right now. Will you not do it again? Mm -hmm. Will you not do it again? That's that's praying in faith. Are you not, did you not, will you not? That's good. Mm. That's the way God wants you so, to pray in faith. Can I lean into this? Sure. So is he not the God that put a dream in Rick and Kay Warren's hearts yeah. mm. and watched it grow from a little seed in a heart to a mighty movement of God yeah. that spread in this generation all over the world? Yeah. And will he not do Amen. it again? He will, will he do not, it again. Will he, he will do it again. Do it that... The gateway cities of the world will be reached and there will be a thriving church within 10 to 15 minutes of every person on the West Coast. Will he not do it again? Amen. Will you not do it again? Woo! Amen. Awesome. You know, Andy and I could go on this one for a long time because over and over in scripture, God just keeps saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What's he saying? It doesn't matter who's leading, I'm still God. Amen. That's three generations. I was God in the first generation, I am be God in the second generation, I will be God in the third generation because I, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. Amen. Right. So. We have great days ahead of us. Yes. Amen. Jesus said, because of your faith, it will happen. According to your faith, it will be unto you. You get to choose how much God blesses the next 10 years of Saddleback Church. You know what? I think I'm going to like sitting on the front row listening. To <laughs> I think I'm going to like that. You're going to like that. I'm going to like that. I'm going to like that. Well, I, you know what? We're going to get a front row seat. I know. And you know what I like? You know, I like the fact that, you know, at some point you stop being the daddy in the family. You start becoming the grandpa which means you get to spoil all the kids and don't have to do any of the discipline. <laughs> I'm looking forward, I've been the pastor for 43 years, now I'm gonna be the grand pastor. <laughs> which means I don't have to make any decisions anymore. And I'm happy about that. <laughs> all right, number seven. And I know every one of you, Stacy, you, Kay, Andy, all of you are gonna to wanna to talk on this one. Faith is trusting if I don't get it. That's the seventh. Thing we get from Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. Trusting God if I don't get it. Not everyone listed in God's hall of fame in Hebrews 11 had a miracle. Yeah. Some of them were beheaded. Right. Some of them were imprisoned. Some of them got sick and died. Not everybody in God's hall of fame had every prayer answered the way they wanted. A lot of people suffered for being faithful. When you see someone suffering and you say, well, you're just not living right, there's a word for that. You're the friend of Job. And God says Job's friends were wrong. Job had done nothing wrong. He was just sick because God had allowed it. God had allowed that illness. Not every sickness is a sin. Job got really sick, Job was really weak, and his friends kept saying, well, it's really because your fault if you just eat better and exercise, whatever. No, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29, and, excuse me, 39 and 40 says this. 
they were all, talking about heroes of the faith, they were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. You know what I love about the Bible? It's so gut honest. It doesn't say it's all pie in the sky. It doesn't say everybody will be healed, because we're not. It doesn't say everybody will be a millionaire, because we won't be. It says none of those people in that list received what had been promised. God had planned something better. Now, let me say this. Fact number one, God always hears and always answers every single prayer. Fact number two, he doesn't always answer every prayer the way you want. God answers prayers four ways. Yes, no, wait, and you gotta be kidding. Okay. All four of those are answers. We, we think the only answer is yes. God says no sometimes. God says slow sometimes. God says grow sometimes before you're ready. And God says go sometimes. Mm. God does not always answer prayer the way we want. God is not a genie. You serve him. He doesn't serve you. God is not a vending machine you put in a prayer and you pick out a pack of cigarettes. A vending machine will give you stuff you don't, that'll not be good for you. God always knows what's best for you. If you could understand God's every move, you'd be God. In fact, if you could understand why God doesn't answer every prayer the way you want, God would not be big enough to handle your problems. Anybody can trust God when things are going great. But real faith, Walking in faith, faith walking, means you're gonna develop that kind of real faith in the valleys of life. I, I learned more about faith in Matthew's death than anything else in my lifetime, the death of a son. Living by faith does not exempt you from problems. 43 years of our example proves that. Sometimes we pray for God to remove a problem instead he gives us the strength to go through it. And I would just say personally, because I'm gonna let everybody else talk about this, the hurts that I've prayed about most to be removed in my life have never been answered the way I want them to, and those very things taught me the most in leadership. I learned, I learned nothing through fame. I learned nothing through pleasure. I learned nothing through prosperity. Everything I learned in my life, I learned through pain. Hmm. Yeah. The Bible says Jesus was made perfect through suffering. How do you think you're gonna be made perfect? The Bible says Jesus learned obedience through suffering. How do you think you're gonna learn obedience? Now, let's talk about this for just a minute. Faith is trusting God when God doesn't say yes, when, when you don't get the answer you want. Yeah. Um, I can think of a lot of examples from our life where we've experienced this. Andy and I experienced infertility for about six years. Um, and that was really painful of, of praying and trusting God for a baby and not receiving the answer to that prayer like we had hoped. Um, when we finally did get pregnant, we were overjoyed. I mean, we could not explain to you the level of joy that we experienced. And then we miscarried. And so the, the pain of that experience was, was gut-wrenching. And it really shook me to the core. And just what is my foundation? And what, what do I truly believe here about God and his goodness and his faithfulness to carry me in a moment like this and just learning to trust him in the dark when I didn't understand what he was doing, why he would allow this to happen, what his plan is, but being able just to, to trust that, that he is in control and that all those things I believed about him before I was in the dark, they're, they're still true about him. And more recently, um, I don't know, maybe four years ago or so, I had to have a pretty major jaw reconstructive surgery. And um, out of that, I have nerve damage in my face. And it's like 
kind of painful all the time. And I'm always like, I'm always aware of the nerve damage and it's limiting to some of my activities. And I, um, I have prayed so many times for healing. I've had people pray over me for healing and God's not healing me and he could. I don't, I don't have any lack of faith that he's able, but for whatever reason, he's just not choosing to. And sometimes he does that. And it's just, um, it's in those moments that we just get to say, God, I don't, I don't understand, but I, I do trust you. Mm. And I, I believe that you're good and that you care and that you see me. And even in this darkness, that, that I believe that, that you're, you're a good God, you're a good father. And, and I'm going to lean into that faith instead of the feeling of, of disappointment or frustration. There, it's in these moments where, the, where Satan wants to get a wedge in there between us and our relationship with God. And he, he inserts doubt and bitterness and he allows this disappointment and hurt to, to be the filter through which we see all of life. But also in these moments, it's an opportunity for us to lean into God at a deeper level and to experience the comfort of the Holy Spirit like we've never experienced before. And sometimes in our own bitterness, we throw up a wall between ourselves and God. And we can't even experience the comfort that he wants to bring us in those moments. And so I think that this point is really significant part of faith, that we all have to go through these seasons of darkness to really understand what it means to trust God in the dark. That's good. That's really good. Amen. Really Andy, you want to say anything? There are two things that are incredibly helpful for me. One is the belief that God cares more about who I am than what I do. So God will bring me through things that are not what I would expect circumstantially to form me. Uh -huh. And so I can interpret the pain through that lens. There are moments where the pain is so great, but if I see the purpose in the pain, mm -hmm. it helps me endure. And then secondly, and we talked about this earlier, yeah. we live in a fallen world. Yeah. There, there's broke, our bodies are broken, the world is broken, the people that we live with, Stacy's broken. <laughs> Very um, little though, right? Um, <laughs> just and, a few flaws. Yeah, I have fewer, but um, just, <laughs> just kidding. Anybody that knows us, you know, that's- Spoken like a man. Uh, uh, but if I, if I can embrace that, it does change my interpretation because if I have such a high standard for everybody else in every circumstance that there's never going to be imperfection, never going to be brokenness, then it makes me so much less patient. Yeah. So I have, to, I have to see through that lens yeah. embracing the reality of the brokenness of this world. Mm. Great. Yeah. Katie, bring us home. Hmm. Well, hmm. It's really hard to remain joyfully trusting in God when the bottom falls out. And that can look different for different people. Mm -hmm. When there's just devastating news or circumstances that you have... Um, begged would never happen or pleaded, if you've ever pled with God on behalf of someone you love, um, I just don't know that there's anything more desperate than to realize that you're pleading and you're agonizing and you're calling out to God and crying out to God does not result in what you're crying and pleading and begging for. That is, um, for me, been the most brutal test of faith was to lose Matthew. And I'm, I think what made it even harder than losing a child, which is so hard by itself, but I had, I had come to this place in my faith where I felt like in the story of Gideon, Gideon put out fleeces, you know, he put out these fleeces that he mm. was testing God's, um, did I really hear you, God? And so mm. he put out these fleeces mm -hmm. and he, he did these tests. I'm not somebody that grew up in a, in a particular faith tradition that used fleeces, 
But in my desperation at one point when Matthew was doing so poorly, I remember sitting on his street where he lived about four houses down from his house. I hadn't heard from him for several days. I didn't know if he was alive. Um, I didn't know. Um, And I was sitting down the street from his house and just my heart as a mother just called out to God and said, could you just give me a sign? Could you give me a sign Mm -hmm. that he's not only alive, but that he's going to be okay? And I had really never asked for that before, never really occurred to me to do that. But I did that night. And without going into all the details, within a few minutes, there was this moment in which Matthew walked out to his mailbox and got his mail. And such a simple thing. But I had just said, God, I am so desperate. Could you please let me know that he's alive? And if he's alive, then that's going to tell me that you are working and he's going, he is going to live. And so just that simple act of him walking out to his mailbox was the most like one of this, I was giddy. I was giddy that not only was he alive, but I took that as a promise from God that, um, that God was going to heal him. And within a few months, um, Matthew had died. And I honestly didn't know what to do with that because God didn't need to give me that. Fully. He didn't need to... I didn't, I mean, he didn't have to answer it. He could have just let me sit there and, and cause lots of other times I've asked for signs and didn't get them, but I, but I got a sign and, and I had held on to that through some really dark moments and, and it had built my faith into believing that of, of a, a certain outcome that was going to happen. And when it didn't, I was left with um, this, pile of ashes, really. My faith felt like it had been reduced to ashes, and there were just these, um, I I wasn't even angry as much as I just was empty Mm. and numb, and I just didn't know what to do from there. Where do you go Mm. when you feel certain that God has met you in, in your faith? And he's gone beyond even what you've asked, and he's reassured you, and, and you're holding on to this. And then, then it doesn't necessarily, that outcome isn't what happens. It sounds similar to your, when you God answered your prayer for a baby, and, and then, then your baby died. And um, you just don't always know what to do from that moment. And it took a while, really to, I didn't walk away from God. I wasn't angry at the time, but I think I felt very hurt. Yes. I think I felt maybe betrayed, Mm -hmm. like a friend really let me down. And as somebody who had followed God my entire life with passion, I just didn't know what to do with that. Mm. And over time, as I, as Stacy referred to, our, Our enemy's number one goal for us is to pull us away from intimacy with God. If he can separate us from believing that God is good, that God's nature, that his character is good, that he can be trusted even when things don't turn out the way that we expect them to, if he can pull us away from that warm intimacy with God, he has won. Mm -hmm. And a friend told me, you know, Kay, you always thought the battle was for Matthew, but actually the battle was for you. The battle was for your faith. Would your faith be able to trust no matter what happened? Don't, do you understand that the battle was always about you? And when I realized that and saw how the enemy was using mm-hmm. our, our excruciating loss to try to separate me from intimacy from God, from from not walking away, but just having it all go cold. Just have it go cold. 
then I knew that that could not be where I needed to land. Mm -hmm. And over then the period of time of pushing myself intentionally, I, I had a picture of just dragging myself back to the cross. You talked about the cross, Andy, but it was dragging myself back to the cross and, and weeping at the foot of the cross with my broken heart mm. and my broken dreams and my faith that felt like it was in tatters and in ashes. But what I, what I learned through that is that because I had spent more than 50 years putting my spiritual roots deep into the goodness and the character of God, that when the circumstances of my life shook the tree of my faith, the roots held. Wow. The roots held. So good. I have um, prayed with tens of thousands of people one-on-one -on -one, with every imaginable problem you can imagine. And here's the little dirty secret about Christianity. The reason you don't pray is you don't really think it works. And there's a reason why you don't think it works. Because there's promises in the Bible where God says this, just like Tate said, and then you pray and it doesn't happen. It does not happen. I struggled with this all my life. Why do you have to say all? If you ask anything in my name, all things are possible. All and every and any, they were these like superlative None, there's no, no loophole there. Whatever you ask in my name, I will give it to you that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, ask and you will receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Over 20 times in scripture we're told to ask, but the truth is you don't get everything you ask for and not those, those promises do not appear to be true. So what does that mean? I want you to remember this. God has all of eternity to keep his promises. Mm. Yeah. He is not limited to just here and now. There is more to life than just here and now. This is not all there is to the story. Mm. The story will be for eternity. And God has all of eternity to keep his promises to you. What we're talking about in this series, the adventure of faith walking, is the most important thing we can talk about. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. The just shall live by faith according to your faith that will be done unto you. So let me summarize this as we launch a series. I'll restrate it. And as I restate these, I want you to evaluate yourself. Which of these do I need to work on first? All right, here it is. Faith means, walking by faith means believing when I don't see it. You have a problem with that? Faith means obeying when I don't understand it. Faith means persisting even when I don't feel like it. Faith means announcing it in advance, even when it looks stupid and embarrassing and nobody believes you. Announcing it in advance before I have it. F putting your reputation on the line and going for it and say, this is what's gonna happen. And it's happening right now. Faith is giving when I don't have it. Faith is thanking God before I receive it. Faith is trusting God if I don't get it. If you'll work on those the rest of your life, you will be a woman of God. You will be a man of God. So then the big question is, okay, Rick, how? How do I grow in faith? Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing 
the word of God. You're not gonna get faith built on social media. It will never build your faith. Right. You're not gonna get your faith built watching television or Netflix. You're not gonna get your faith built any other way except by feeding on the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word will never pass away. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God abides forever. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It is this book. And what has kept me solid for 52 years in faith is being in this book. Be in it every day. Get in it all the time. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Follow me in this prayer. You don't have to say it aloud, just say it in your heart. Father, I want to be a man or woman of faith. I want to be a man or woman of faith. Say, Father, help me to believe when I don't see it. Help me to obey when I don't understand it. Help me to persist even when I don't feel like it. Help me to announce it in advance before I have it. Help me to give when I don't have it. Help me to thank you before I receive it. And God, help me to trust you even if I don't get it. If you've never opened your life to Jesus Christ, say, Jesus Christ, by faith, I ask you to come into my life right now. By faith, I ask you to save me. Say that in your mind. By faith, I ask you to forgive me and save me and bring me into your family. By faith, I ask you to give me eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanna say this, that if someone here had opened your life to Jesus for the very first time, you can text me, new start at 83,000, or you can email me, new start at saddleback.com for some free resources. If you're not in a small group, there's notes at the bottom of your outline. If you'd like to give an offering in faith, there's notes at the bottom of your outline. It's gonna be a good series, and we're gonna have a good time together. God bless you, everybody. I'd like to thank Kay, Stacy, and Andy for preaching this sermon with me, all right? Uh, thank you, guys. And I look at you, and I know that our days ahead of us are just so great. Andy, I love you. <laughs> Stacy, I love you. Love you. Love you. Kay, I really love you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stand, and we're going to sing our last song together.